Okay, so we're going to look at applications of second order equations and mass on a spring is the classic example. And so we'll start by looking at an unforced mass on a spring. So we'll do a little theory and equation and application. And then the four cases, over damped, critically damped, under damped, undamped, and then talk a little bit about bifurcations. So what's a mass on a spring and what's the ordinary differential equation that we want to think about from mass on a spring? So we generally think of it as we've got a spring. It looks like this. And we've got a mass that looks like that. And this is some kind of a surface that's just sliding on. And remember Newton's second law that F equals MA. So how do we want to deal with this? Well, at equilibrium is, X, is Y equals zero. Increasing Y is to the right. Decreasing Y is to the left. And Y equals zero is when the mass is at rest at equilibrium. Uh, the spring constant, the spring has a constant K, and there's a friction constant, which we'll call B. So, acceleration, that's the A in um, force equals mass times acceleration, is the second derivative of position. So, d squared y dt squared. So, what's the force on the mass? So the spring force is F equals minus KY. So K here is a constant and it measures how hard it is to compress the spring. So if you can just squish it easily, um, then K is a small number. If it takes a lot of force to compress it a little bit, then um, K is a large number. And so Y is the distance that you're pushing it away from equilibrium. So that's the spring force. The friction force, there's a lot of different ways to model friction. And we'll call this F equals minus BV, where V equals velocity. So there's some constant B, that's our friction force. And as you move, the friction force opposes the velocity, right? It, slows you down. So it points in the opposite direction of the velocity. So the force on the mass is the spring force, which is minus ky, um, and the friction force minus dv, or e squared y dt squared multiplied by m and that's the mass of our mass, whatever that is, equals minus ky minus b, and velocity is the derivative of position, so dy dt. And if we move our forces over to the other side, we get a second order differential equation m is m d squared y dt squared plus b d y dt plus k y equals zero. This is the unforced spring. You just, you know, push the spring and the mass moves back and forth and you see what happens. We'll look at forcing later, but if there's an external force, then this equation, the force on the mass, becomes m d squared y dt squared equals minus ky minus b dy dt plus f of t. And this is the force, external force on it. And so then that becomes m, oops, m d squared y dt squared plus b, dy dt plus ky equals whatever our force is. And we've seen that we can solve that using um, undetermined coefficients. So often we will take our unforced spring equation. And since we are mathematicians and not so much um, physicists, we'll just divide through everything by m.
And so the mathematical equation we want to solve is this. And so P is our friction force and Q is the spring, right? And traditionally those are B and K, but if I'm gonna divide the entire thing by M, then I have B over M, that's my P, K over M, that's my Q. So friction per unit mass, uh, spring constant per unit mass. So that's the equation we'll be dealing with for the unforced spring. So the equation for mass on a spring is that, um, this is a forcing function and we want P, that's our friction force. Oh, that should actually be, be greater than or equal to zero uh, because sometimes we wanna deal with um, cases where there's no friction. And Q, well, we have a spring, so Q has to be greater than zero. So there's four cases, right? Because when we solve the homogeneous equation, right? You have three cases, which are, um, depends on whether the square root of B squared minus four Q is actually, greater than zero, equal to zero, less than zero. So overdamped means that you get two negative eigenvalues, R1 and R2. So you get K1 e to the R1t plus K2 e to the R2t. And both of these are negative. Critically damped has P squared minus four Q equal to zero. So you have a repeated eigenvalue. And then we have this, which we've seen before. And then under damped is P squared minus four Q is less than zero and we get complex conjugate eigenvalues, and we know that the homogeneous solution is gonna involve e to the at cosine bt, e to the a sine bt. And the last case is the undamped case. That's when we have no friction and your eigenvalues are plus or minus i squared of q. There's no real part to that. So your homogeneous solution is k1 cosine plus k2 sine. So those are the four cases we wanna look at. So why is the mass and spring so important? So in physics, one of the things you learn is that force and potential energy are related to each other. Force is the derivative of potential energy. So if we think about potential energy as a Taylor series and Y of zero as being some equilibrium. So this is the Taylor series for potential energy, right? which you remember from calculus two. So what's an equilibrium in physics? An equilibrium is a place where you're not moving and that's a minimum of the potential energy function. So u prime of y zero equals zero and u double prime of y zero is positive, right? Because if you remember um, what a minimum function is, the derivative is equal to zero and the second derivative is positive. So if the derivative is equal to zero, this equals zero, we get this. And so what's the force? Well, the force is the derivative of that um, minus du dy. And so the derivative of this term is just zero and then we differentiate the whole thing. So force then is this, and y minus y zero is how far you are away from equilibrium, right? Y zero is equilibrium, y is whatever position we are, so y minus y zero is how far you are away from equilibrium. If you're close to equilibrium, we're just making small motions about equilibrium, then we can ignore this term because y minus y zero squared is just too small to be paid attention to. And so that gives us, this, f of y is minus ky, where k is this thing, and then we're thinking about y as just being that, um, the distance from equilibrium. So, there's why we're interested in mass on a spring. Any physical system near equilibrium behaves like a mass on a spring. The non-physical systems, like in economics and stuff, which are, might at equilibrium be, also behave like a mass on a spring and be um, and follow these kinds of rules. But you have to think about it in your, in, say, economics to figure out what might be the potential energy, uh, what might be the spring, what might be the friction. So, but if you look at chemistry, for example, you get this kind of an image where it says that a crystal that's composed of lithium and fluorine, so Li plus and F minus, is behaves like a bunch of atoms connected by springs, right? When it's a crystal, it's at equilibrium. You can jostle a little bit, but it behaves basically like a bunch of springs together. So four types of spring systems, what the homogeneous equations are and what the graphs look like. So in an overdamped system, friction is stronger than the spring constant in a way. 
right? And the spring doesn't isolate, it just grinds to a halt. So here's a spring of mass one with spring constant 16, friction constant 10, mass is pulled one unit from equilibrium released. So what's the in, uh, initial value problem for this situation? Solve the problem and sketch a graph of the solution. So, So that is our equation for mass on a spring. Spring constant is 16, that's the Q. Friction constant is 10, that's the P. So the equation we're dealing with is that. Your initial condition is saying that it was pulled one unit from equilibrium, so Y of zero equals one. So at time t equals zero, it's one unit away from equilibrium. And then it's released, which means we're not giving it a push or anything. So that tells me that the derivative, the initial velocity is just zero. And so there's our usual um, initial value problem to try and solve these things. So we do the usual thing, right? Find the characteristic equation. This can be factored, r plus eight times r minus two equals zero. So my eigenvalues are r1 equals minus eight, r2, that's a plus two there, equals minus two. So what's my equation? k1 e to the minus eight t plus k2 e to the minus two t. So there we go. So that's the solution, right? Use initial conditions to find K1, K2. I'm not actually gonna grind through that. Um, and we get K1 is one third and K2 is two thirds. Right, and you can work that out if you want. So our solution is one third e to the minus eight t plus two thirds e to the minus two t. And what does this graph look like? Well, initial condition is y of zero equals one. So we're starting up there. Y prime of zero equals zero means that this has to be, have a horizontal tangent line because the slope there, the derivative is zero. Um, as t goes to positive infinity, exponentials with a negative exponent go down to zero. So a curve is gonna look like that. Oop. It's just gonna end up along there. In negative time, as t goes to negative infinity, this term dominates because it's a bigger power. And so it'll look like that. But we're only really interested in for t greater than zero, right? Because at t equals zero is when we put the, oh, my tablet was tilted a little bit there. t equals zero is when we put the thing in motion. So we're not really worried about the left side of that. The important point here is as t goes to infinity, y h of t goes to zero, not a big surprise, right? If you've got friction, what happens in the energy in your system? it dissipates. So eventually if spring comes to rest. Okay, so we'll pull this up a little bit. Critically damped, what does a critically damped system look like? So this is, <clears throat> oh, right. So in this particular example, an over damped um, system, we have exponentials with negative exponents. And so you just, it just grinds to a halt. Critically damped is sort of when this friction and the spring constant balance each other. The spring grinds to a halt without oscillating, but it looks a lot like the overdamped case. So here, what's our ODE and what's the initial value position? So d squared y dt squared plus whatever your friction constant is, six dy dt plus nine times the spring constant equals zero. 
because we're not forcing it. And at equilibrium, it's pushed so that it has one unit of speed. That tells me that y of zero equals zero, y prime of zero equals one, right? So its initial velocity is one, its initial position is zero. So r squared plus six r plus nine equals zero. That factors as r plus three quantity squared equals zero. And that tells me that r equals minus three repeated. So the solution then is yhp is k1 e to the minus 3t plus k2 t e to the minus 3t. Excellent. So um, if you actually grind in the numbers, We use the initial conditions to find K1 and K2. Um, we get that K1 equals zero, K2 equals one. So our solution then is T e to the minus three T. So what does the graph of that look like? We're only really interested in for T greater than zero. And we know that we're starting at the initial condition y of zero equals zero, so it's starting at the origin, and we know that we have a initial slope, initial velocity is one there. So our curve is gonna, we give it a push, it goes off and it moves a little bit, and then it dies down, right? The negative exponent forces that to go to zero. And we have that because we have friction and friction will force things to go to zero. Okay, so underdamped. Now, underdamped spring is the friction is, the spring constant is sort of um, higher than the friction, right? So we have a pretty good strong spring constant or not a lot of friction. And so the spring is actually gonna oscillate a little bit. So, What's our differential equation here? d squared y dt squared plus the friction force, which is four times dy dt, plus the spring constant, which is five y equals zero. The mass at equilibrium is pushed so as one unit of speed. So that again is y of zero equals zero. We're starting at equilibrium and we're giving it one unit of velocity. So the velocity is one. So that's the problem. Now, when we try and solve this, our characteristic equation is this. And if you solve that, you get R equals minus two plus or minus I, right? And the imaginary part, that means we're gonna involve cosines and sines. So, y h of t is going to be k1 e to the minus t cosine of no, e to the minus 2t because of the 2 there, cosine of t plus k2 e to the minus 2t sine of t. Right? And notice this sine and cosines there. Now, initial conditions, use those to solve for k, and you end up with k1 equal to 0 and k2 equal to 1. So y of t equals e to the minus 2t sine of t. And we saw how to graph things like this in the um, trigonometry video. We know that sine of t is between minus 1 and 1. And so minus e to the minus 2t is less than or equal to e to the minus 2t sine of t is less than or equal to e to the minus 2t. So our solution curve is going to e to the minus 2t goes through one, looks like that. E to the, this is y equals e to the minus 2t. And then this is y equals minus e 
to the minus 2t. So those are our, amp our amplitude is that. And so our sine function is going to oscillate between these two curves. We're starting at 0 with initial slope of 1. Goes up, down, and up, and down, and up, and down. And so the spring is oscillating a little bit, right? one sine cycle between zero and two pi, but the oscillations are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you end up with, um, again, because of the negative exponents, you end up with a uh, coming to a halt when y equals zero. And again, the reason why you come to a halt is because of this part, right? That four dy dt, that's where the minus two comes from. So, that's the friction force and that gives you the exponent. So if you have any friction, eventually you come to a halt and that means that you always have an exponent term with a negative exponent. Now, finally, undamped, these are springs that have no friction. Now, physically, of course, you can't have that, um, but sometimes you can have friction lowered enough so that's a reasonable approximation. You can use um, you know, WD-40, you can put things on ice. There's all sorts of ways to reduce friction. Um, some systems that can be modeled as a massless spring don't actually have friction. And so um, when you do, I think when you do superconductivity, you kind of get that kind of behavior, but you end up with things that don't actually have friction sometimes. And so you use these kinds of approximations. So what's our equation if you have no friction? Well, d squared y dt squared plus zero, times dy dt, so we don't have that term, plus nine times y, because that's our spring constant. And so if we have no friction, that means we have no dy dt term. So y of zero is one, because we're one unit from equilibrium nine units of speed, that means our initial velocity is going to be nine. So that's the initial value problem for this situation. What's the solution and what does the graph look like? So r squared plus nine equals zero, that's our characteristic equation, r squared equals nine. So r is plus or minus three i, and that means that our solution is k1 cosine of three t, plus k2 sine of 3t. OK, but there's no exponential term here because we don't have any friction at all. Now, if we use the initial conditions to find k1 and k2, we end up with um, k1 equals to minus 1 and k2 equals to 2. So. Our solution is minus cosine of 3t plus 2 sine of 3t. And as we did in the video on trigonometry, we would like to rewrite this as a cosine 3t minus v. And what we saw in that particular, uh, in the trig video, is that a squared, a little bit of Pythagoras going on here, but a squared is the coefficient of cosine squared plus coefficient of sine squared. So a squared equals um, four plus one is five. So a equals square root of five. The other thing that we saw in the um, Trig video is that the tangent of phi, that's our phase angle here, is equal to, well, tangent is sine over cosine. So we take this term, which is the coefficient of sine, two, and we divide it by the coefficient of cosine. That gives me minus one. So that tells me that arc tangent of minus two is equal to our phase angle phi. And this is about minus 1.67 or about uh, minus 63.45, 47 degrees. Great. So 
our solution can be rewritten then as y of t equals square root of five cosine three t minus uh, plus 1.67. So when we graph this, what do we get? We're gonna get something, we get a cosine curve. Where's the basic period start and end? Well, a basic period for cosine is zero to two pi. So we want the thing inside the cosine to go from zero to two pi. So what does T actually go from? We subtract 1.67 from each side. Well, all three sides. And then we divide by three. And so the 1.67 over three is about 0.369. So what's our graph look like? We're gonna start at minus 0.369. And at three point two pi over three, two pi over three minus 0.369, that's this part here will have done one complete cosine cycle. And my amplitude is plus or minus square root of five. So there's square root of five, y equals minus square root of five. We get a nice cosine curve like that. And then it just repeats over and over again. So no friction. Right, so it never loses any amplitude and it just oscillates up and down um, as a cosine term. And this is why we wanted to spend a little time doing trigonometry so that we can rewrite these kinds of solutions as cosine terms with a phase angle so we can actually see what they're doing. Great, so that's um, undamped, right? So there's four types of solutions depending on your eigenvalues, you could have two real eigenvalues. That's the overdamped case. It means you've got a lot of friction relative to your spring case and the spring just grinds to a halt. You can have <clears throat> repeated roots and that means your spring and your friction kind of balanced. And again, you just grind to a halt. You can have an underdamped system. This is when you get the complex eigenvalues and then your spring will oscillate a bit as it comes to an end. Or you can have frictionless things where the friction constant is zero and then you just your spring just oscillates back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so bifurcations. We wanna be able to classify oops, our um, spring systems, right? And so the differential equation we're dealing with is that. And it's entirely determined by those two numbers, P and Q, right? So if you have two numbers that determine your system, you can graph that on the plane. So let me set up a plane, two-dimensional plane. And example one, we had um, p equal to 10 and q equal to 16. That was the overdamped system. So if I make this my p axis, this is friction. And I make this my q axis, this is the spring constant. 10 comma 16, well, we'll put 10 out here and 16 up here, let's see. We actually should have 10. We'll put 10 out here and 16 out here. So 10 comma 16 would be about here. And so that means we can plot this equation in the plane. Example two was the critically damped system. 
and that was p equals six, q equals nine. So let's see, we'll put six about here and nine should be about a little bit more than that. So nine is here. And that's example two. The point six comma nine that represents our um, critically damped system. And then finally we had example three um, had P equal to this, the under dam system, P equals to, oh, what I have that one down? Oh, four comma five. P equals four, Q equals five. So four will be about here, five will be about up here. And the last system we had, example four was the undamped system, P equals zero, Q equals nine, and that's this point there. So, right, every system has got two variables, a P and a Q, and you can graph that. The interesting thing about this, though, is that if P squared minus four Q, because when you try and solve this using the quadratic formula, if this is greater than zero, you get this case. So this is overdamped. P squared minus four Q is less than zero. If this is the thing inside the square root, that means you're gonna get a complex thing. So that means you're underdamped, like example three here, 16 minus 20. If P squared equals four Q, that's where you have critically damped case. And that's here, right? Because P squared is 36, four times Q is nine. This, right, we can actually graph this. Q equals P squared over four. So P squared over Q equals P squared over four. It's like Y equals X squared over four, except we're using Q and P. And so that's a graph That looks like this. And that allows us to interpret this plane here. Anything on this side of this parabola, this is all overdamped. Anything on this side of the parabola, this is all underdamped. The critically damped ones are the ones along this parabola. And Q equals zero This part is the critically damped. So this kind of a plane actually allows us to think about what happens to our systems if we can change either the spring constant or the friction constant. So suppose we have a mass of unit one attached to a spring with spring constant 10, but the friction is variable. So what happens to our spring as the friction increases from zero? Well, let's set up the spring constant friction plane. And this is P equals friction. This is Q equals your spring constant. And there's our parabola, which is Q equals P squared over four. Over here, this is the overdamped stuff. This is the underdamped stuff. So the spring constant is 10. So that tells us that Q equals 10. So we'll put 10 here. What we want to know is, is what happens as we increase the friction from zero? So there's a number of different applications for this, right? You can think of it as, um, you know, you have something that's very slippery and you add some roughness to it. Um, you can also think about it in terms of hydraulic presses as a hydraulic shock absorber, right? If you're tightening up the hydraulic, so to make this, the shock absorber stiffer, right? That's increasing the friction, right? The resistance um, increases. If you're dealing with a um, 
electrical circuit, right? Friction is resistance. So if you can increase the resistance, right? This is the sort of behavior that we're looking at. So what happens as you increase the resistance? You start with no resistance, um, increase the friction. If you start with no friction, you can increase the friction by going in that direction. So that's the direction of increasing friction. So what happens? You start out with no friction there, right? And that's just oscillatory behavior. As you increase the friction, your system will be under damped, right? Which means it oscillates and then dies out. When you get to this point, right? Q equals P squared over four, you actually are critically damped. And once you go past that, you're over damped and your system just grinds to a halt. And so that allows us to actually look at our, um, think about our, our system and what happens as friction increases. What we're also interested in is, is what's the friction value here? Where is the critical value that separates being under damped from being over damped? Well, that's, we want the point here and this point is, we can write it as P comma 10, because we know it's spring constant is 10. But you can also write it as P comma P squared over four, because that point is on this parabola, right? And so that tells me that 10 has to equal P squared over four, or P squared equals 40, P equals squared of 40, which is what, two squared of 10? Um, so that's the critical friction amount, right? Once the friction hits square root of 40, then you have flipped over from being under damped to being over damped, or if you're going the other way from over damped to under damped. But if your spring is 10, then that's the friction that's on the critical, um, that's the critical friction that separates under damped from over damped. And we can look at slightly more complicated versions of this, right? So suppose we have a mass of unit one attached to a spring and the friction constant and the spring constant are related by this. And I don't know what kind of a physical situation that is, but we can look at the possible behaviors of this just from a mathematical standpoint. So here's friction. Here's my spring constant. And here is my critically damped parabola, which is Q equals P squared over four. So we have two P plus Q equals eight. This is an equation of a line, right? Remember P is playing the role of X and Q is playing the role of Y. So your P intercept, you set Q equal to zero and solve for P. So P equals four. What's your Q intercept? You set P equal to zero and solve for Q, Q equals eight. So eight, uh, the intercept would be four. We'll put a little circle there because we can't actually have Q equal to zero because if Q is equal to zero, that means you wouldn't actually have a spring. So, what does that tell us about our um, about this weird system? Well, here you are un undamped, right? Just oscillatory behavior. Here it's underdamped, and here it's overdamped. And this point is the um, Transition, the critical point, critically damped, that separates under damped from over damped. What point is that? Well, it's the point on the line, some p value, some p value here, some q value here. We want to know what that point is. 
But that's a point that has to be on both the parabola and our line. So that's where q equals p squared over four and where two p plus q equals eight. So if we plug this in for q into the second equation, you get two p plus p squared. Oh, my handwriting's falling apart. 2p plus p squared over 4 equals 8. And again, that's a quadratic equation. Um, and you can solve that. And it's uh, minus 4 plus or minus p equals minus 4 plus or minus 4 squared of 3. But then you can figure out where it changes from critically damped over damped. So if you have a system where you can tinker with either the friction or the spring constant, right? you can think about, well, as I change that, what happens? And you go from under damped to over damped. Um, and you can figure out what that is by plotting it on the um, spring constant friction plane. You can figure out various uh, bifurcations from that.